Hi, and thank you for joining me for another lecture. And friends, today we're on Haftarat Vayishlach. And this Haftarah is from Ovadia or Obadiah Perak Aleph Pasuk Aleph to Pasuk Chaf Aleph. Or Obadiah chapter 1, verse 1 till verse 21. Okay, reading. Perak Aleph Pasuk Aleph. Chazan Ovadiah ko amar Adonai lo chachem le'edom shemua shamanu me'et Adonai v'tzir bagoyim shulach kuma v'nakuma alecha lemilchama. A vision of Ovadiah. So says the Lord God about Edom. We have heard news from Hashem, and among the nations an envoy has been sent. Arise, let us arise against her to do battle. Hine katon netaticha, bagoyim bazu ata meod. Behold, I have made you small among the nations. You are exceedingly despised. And friends, this will be a good time to discuss who is Edom. Or finally, who is Edom? Now, I get this question a lot, and the truth is that most with a yeshivish background typically do not like my answer. So, who is Edom? Friends, Edom is Edom, and not Rome, Europe, or the church, like many in the Jewish world teach today. And it's a bit funny that I have similar discussions with black Hebrews who swear up and down that America's Egypt or the white man is Edom. No, friends, their ignorance I could easily, or more easily, excuse than that of a well-educated rabbi who, by the way, virtually all teach, like we said, that Edom is Rome, Europe, or the church. So, friends, the question you should ask is, Rabbi Asher, how do you know that Edom is not Rome or the church? And the answer is because there is no historical, geographical, or biblical source to justify that claim. And, friends, you would be surprised how much Jewish end-time prophecy is built and relies on the claim that the ethnic Christian world of today is Edom. Rabbis who make a living teaching end time events, who base everything they pretty much teach on a couple statements made by a sage post the Churban, the destruction of the temple, that held no water even back then. And not to mention the idiotic claim that the Arabs are the actual descendants of Ishmael. All pretty much based on a few Midrashim, as well as the opinion of Muhammad, who, by the way, was very knowledgeable and clearly a student of Midrash and Agadah, when history or evidence does not lend itself to that claim. I mean, remember, even the word Arab comes from Erev, from Mitcher, referring to them descending from many different peoples. I mean, really, friends. Now, one question you should also ask is, where does this desire to label our current day enemies with the same titles given to our biblical enemies stem from? And friends, in my opinion, it stems from a deep desire to free ourselves from the responsibility of looking within ourselves and our own group, and finally taking responsibilities for our actions, and finally realize that we might actually be hated for not keeping Torah, instead of just pointing our fingers to others saying, look, it's Esau, it's Ishmael, they hated us before, and look, they hate us again. So, if Edom is not the church, Rome, or Europeans, who is Edom? Well... Edom was the name that was given to Esav, like it states in Bereshit, that Esav is Edom. Why? Because Edom literally means red. In other words, it was a descriptive term referring to Esav and later his descendants as well. So it's not how many teach that Edom was a son or grandson of Esav, but actually according to the Torah, it was a nickname given to Esav himself. And those familiar with the narrative know that Esav and Yaakov, the brothers, ended up taking different paths in life. Yaakov, who the Almighty later changed to Yisrael, later in life walked with Hashem and eventually got the Torah. And Esav walked in his own way, and his descendants did not. Then we see Edom appear again as one of the nations that did not let Israel cross through it on their way to Canaan. And they did not attack Israel, but just made them go around. The Torah, Hashem himself later on instructs Israel not to despise or mistreat Edomites because they are our brothers. And that's the last the Torah has to say about them till Sefer Shmuel has Shaul Melech defeating them in battle and later David Melech doing the same thing. It actually says that all of Edom became David's subjects and that even from then on all of its kings were actually Israelites, i.e. Jews, appointed by the kingdom of Yehuda. Then history goes on to tell us that they ended up siding with Babel, with Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar against Yehuda, which is why they appear in the books of the prophets awaiting condemnation. So, still friends, no correlation with Rome. And I must also add that Edom was not geographically located where Rome ended up. I mean, actually, not even close. But the fact is that the land of Edom... The land of Edom was literally next to the land of Israel. As a matter of fact, it even encompassed much of southern Israel itself. So no one could say that it was near Rome or Europe. 
And the Idumeans were actually the same group. Actually, it's the same word, Edom or Edomim, that was later Hellenized and pronounced as Idumia. Actually, after siding with Bovel, history teaches us that they were then reconquered by Yehuda around the time of the Maccabees by John Hyrcanus, or Yohanan Hurkanus. And this is when they cease to ever be heard of again as a people. Why? Because, as history teaches, under John Hyrcanus, the Edomites or Idumeans all converted to Judaism. Now, there are a few myths floating around that teach that they were forcibly converted or converted under the threat of death, but Josephus is awfully clear that they were given the option of either leaving the land of Israel or staying and converting. So they chose to stay and convert. Now, what people fail to acknowledge nowadays was that it was perfectly clear back then that even according to Jewish law, that conversion under those circumstances is 100% valid for a people who have no choice but to remain in biblical Israel. Remember, Edom is in biblical Israel, especially at that time when they even had Hebron as their capital. Now, some might ask, why weren't they given the option of becoming Noahides? <laughs> and the truth is that it's really a myth that Noahides ever existed in the land and much less that they ever had communities. No, friends, that's just nonsense force-fed on non-Jews nowadays to keep them from converting. The notion that if one is hungry for truth and meaning in life, he should not convert to Judaism and keep Torah, but become a Noahide and join some make-believe Noahide community. But the truth is that history doesn't mention them. However, the truth is that converting or accepting Israelite law was never a spiritual pursuit, but ultimately just a legal act, like telling someone that if they wanted to live in the U.S., they must subject themselves to the American legal system or even become Americans themselves. Now, don't get me wrong, accepting Torah is definitely, definitely a moral, ethical, and even spiritual pursuit. But that has nothing to do with converting to Judaism, which is why if you look through any of the laws of conversion, you will find that accepting the mitzvot is not a prerequisite. Because converting to Judaism just made you Israel, and accepting the commandments is what made you part of the covenant. It's actually two different procedures. And the idea is really not so far-fetched, because we have the notion that someone could be born into the Jewish people. But of course, that does not mean the person's in the covenant. And no, people can't decide which parents to be born to. So in other words, friends, one procedure is legal and the other one is personal. And why is one useless without the other? Because obviously repairing the world is a team effort and there is no point in walking with God if you're walking alone. So ultimately the Idumeans or the inhabitants of Edom were absorbed into Israel. And as a matter of fact, Josephus puts it the clearest when he states in Antiquities that after their conversion, they were accepted as full Jews. And Josephus also writes that during the siege of Rome against Jerusalem, 20,000 Edomite converts died defending Jerusalem from the Romans. So it's kind of hard how they can be Rome themselves when even during the destruction of the Second Temple, they were fighting Rome. So friends, till now, still no trace of Edom being Rome, the church, or Europeans. And friends, the truth is that there is no trace anywhere. Now, the closest thing you will find is among the Herodian dynasty. Actually, it goes back when Antipater, a descendant of Idumean converts, was appointed as governor of Yehuda under Rome. Actually, his father Antipas was governor of Idumea or Edom, and he was placed there under the rule of the Hasmoneans, the Hashmonaim, which, yes, were all Jews. And from this line arose Herod, who was in bed with the Romans, as was virtually all the upper echelon of Judean society of the time. So a connection may have been made between Herod's Idumean roots and his connection to Rome. But if this is where the actual connection was made, it seems pretty weak. And another important fact that even encroaches on Jewish law is that many seem to ignore that the Gemara is crystal clear that even in their day, the law was that biblical nations from a homogeneous perspective were lost because of the many conquests of Sanherib, the Assyrian who uprooted the peoples of all the nations he conquered and displaced them and replaced them with other nations throughout the world. And yes, Edom was one of those nations. Actually, even the northern kingdom of Israel was one of those nations, which is why the Samaritans are still with us today. Which is why the halakha is that we're forbidden, that we're not allowed to exclude anyone from joining or being a part of the Jewish people because of who their descendants may have been. Because the halakha is that today we don't know. Or worse, hate anyone because of it. So remember that the next time you point your finger at a Muslim and call him Yishmael or point your finger at a Christian or European and call him Edom. And if you're really interested in what Chazal had to say about Edom, 
Just open up an Ein Yaakov or just a Gemara. You see so many tales uttered by our sages that have no basis, completely butchering Tanakh and history and twisting the words to, to make Edom fit into Rome. But friends, it doesn't. And friends, don't think that if you agree with me that this in some way makes you a Karite or someone who rejects the oral law. Because I'll say it again, that the oral law has nothing, nothing to do with Midrashim and Agadot, with legend and folklore, but only practical law. To the point that they even call this current Galut or exile that we're in, the Galut Edom. And why do they insist? Well, because for the same reason that the book of Revelation insists on equating the Catholic Church with the whore of Babylon. And it's pretty simple if you think about why they actually do this. And that's because, friends, the only way you could scare people in either becoming or remaining religious is by making them feel that they're on the verge of a catastrophe that can only be avoided by choosing a side. And friends, this has been done every generation like with Christians and the rapture or the Jews with the notion that Mashiach is right around the corner, equivalent to Trotsky's permanent revolution. Friends, when people do not have an evil to fight, they manufacture one. And many rabbis swear up and down that the church or Europeans must be Rome because then how do you explain all those portions in the prophets? Really, friends, I guess it couldn't be like Hillel taught that all the prophecies already took place in and around the time of Cheskiyahu HaMelech. But anyways, long story short, Edom is no longer. They converted to Judaism. And I know that much and many Mekubalim hate to hear this, that the fact is that we as Jews have Edomite blood pumping through our veins because of that mass conversion. And friends, if you really want to put your finger on what has caused the most theological confusion in the world today, in my opinion, hands down, it was and is Midrashim and Agadot, i.e. Jewish folklore and legend, taken seriously. And friends, this is actually what gave birth to Christianity and Islam. Because the truth is that both Christianity and Islam's ideologies are nothing more than a bunch of contradictory midrashim that have been codified, and that's all. Which is why I think that Jewish counter-missionaries, as long as they continue to deify midrashim, are wasting their time and could never, never defeat a messianic who's knowledgeable of midrashim and agadot, including the Zohar. Because virtually every Christian and Islamic doctrine has their roots in Jewish legends. Because that's exactly what division and inconsistencies in a belief system formulate. They formulate splinter groups. In other words, because failing to understand that legend and folklore is not part of Judaism, it has actually ended up creating so much more nonsense masquerading itself as the true emunah that sometimes it seems that the world could never recover. All for falling into the Avedah and to the prohibition of adding to the Torah. Now, just a reminder, again, only because you completely dismiss Midrashim and Agadot does not in any way mean that you're not a rabbinic Jew or you do not believe in the oral law. Because the fact is that Midrashim and Agadot are not part of the oral law, mainly because they typically do not deal with law. And this, friends, is a fact that I have to constantly drill because the fools in the rabbinic world today have tried to slip Jewish legend and folklore into Judaism under the guise of oral law for centuries to the point that they have even tried to include every statement uttered by popular modern-day rabbis also as oral law. In other words, what makes someone a rabbinic Jew or someone who accepts Torah Shabbat Peh or the oral law is only someone who embodies the command of Lo Tasur, as it appears in Deuteronomy chapter 17 in Parashat Shoftim, of not straying from the legal rulings of the court, the great court, the great Sanhedrin. And again, yes, these rulings were only legal and could never involve or include the metaphysical or legends and tales not verified by Torah, but only practical law as pretty much any knowledgeable rabbi will tell you today, that we don't paskin from Midrashim, even hashkafically. Okay, moving on. Um, I really want to focus on Pasuk Bet here where it says, That behold, I have made you small among the nations. You are exceedingly despised. Almost letting the reader know that although this Pasuk is clearly speaking about Edom, that size ultimately does matter. That being limited to a small nation is for all intents and purposes a curse. Or why would the Almighty even care to entice Avram Avinu with the promises of his descendants being as numerous as the stars or as the sand on the seashore? Now we know that technically, if we were small, but at the same time keeping the Almighty's instructions, we would still be able to leave the Almighty's imprint on the world. But unfortunately, that is not the way the Creator functions. Now, Torah teaches us that he virtually always uses natural means to achieve supernatural results. 
Or why do you think that being small and scattered typically always spells disaster? And not just for Jews, but for any people, for the same reason that in the animal kingdom it is the small, the weak, and frail that get eliminated first. Or why was it when Israel was its strongest and most prosperous, was actually the only time in history that it was at peace with its neighbors, which was during the time of Shlomo Melech, when again, the children of Israel were numerous. But even geographically, Israel was its largest. Not to mention that a refusal to not worry about size and influence really demonstrates on how ultimately interested a group is in impacting others around them with their values. And friends, this brings up a topic I've heard mentioned many times to in a way try justifying the fact that we're small in number, in a way stating that this is how God wanted it to be, which is also an excuse given on why we push people or new adherents away lest we change the pattern we see throughout history. Really, friends, in a religion where the average person or who is born into it is fighting to get out, what stupidity, which is actually one of the reasons that many leave Judaism in the first place, because apart from assuming that we are destined to be small, that also in some way we were destined to be persecuted, like Elie Wiesel writes on how he doesn't mind belonging to a people with a mission, but he didn't know that it was going to be a suicide mission. And all this, friends, is really the result of asceticism that has crept into the Emunah the last thousand years. So how does one respond to this line of thinking? Well, by clearly expounding on the Peshat of the Hebrew Bible and by directly confronting this gross misrepresentation of scripture that has almost sadly become dogmatic in the Jewish world. And although this idea is unbiblical, the idea that we were destined to be small, it has actually been in the Jewish world for thousands of years that eventually gave birth to notions of intrinsic worth in Judaism, a connection that is easily made after you corrupt one area of Torah thought. Think about it. If you have a God who intentionally wants to keep you small, it first tells you that He, the Almighty, not only does not care if you influence others, but rather He purposely wants others to stay away. That others don't hate you because of you, but because the Almighty programmed them to. Because, again, you were destined to be small and vulnerable. In other words, there is nothing you could say to others to get them to ever want to join you because you weren't allowed to expand. In other words, you have a maximum occupancy quota. And it also gives the impression that the Almighty actually cares about flesh and blood and not behavior and intentions. Teaching us that the Almighty himself is an amoral God, not caring about what is good or evil, and in some way, twistedly infatuated with the small Semitic tribe called Israel. No, friends, behavior like that would be unbecoming of a good, moral, and just God, someone unworthy of worship. And friends, if you're part of the Orthodox world, I know you have heard rabbis mention it before, the famous words of the Rebbe, that God created us to be Israel and created them to be Goyim, and that we should be glad to be what the Almighty has made us, ultimately small and frail, almost teaching us that it's a waste of time to aspire. Tell that to anyone who wears glasses or, or bothers to brush your teeth or have surgery for any ailment they happen to be naturally born with. In other words, if we took that ideology to heart, by definition, we would never improve. However, friends, the truth is that we were not destined to be small. But like we said, as the Almighty promised Avraham, that we have the potential to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. In other words, if we were ever small and despised, as Torah states, it is always our fault because of what we've done and not because of how the Creator destined it to be. And if you ask, what could we possibly have done? Well, friends, by the simple fact that we failed to influence this world with the ethical monotheism contained within the Torah is reason enough. In other words, by failing to educate the world we have created our own enemies. So why does the modern day Jewish world continue with this form of victimized thought when the notion doesn't appear in Torah? Easy, because it feels good to be small and the underdog. Mainly because when you've been down for so long, you begin to discern the V for victim to in some way stand for victory. Actually, I've seen many rabbis as well as Christians use the tochacha, the tochacha, the portions in Torah that depict the curses that we will go through when we're shunned by the Creator as proof that we were destined to suffer. When they fail to mention that before and after the Torah mentions these curses, it first speaks of all we can acquire and achieve just by keeping Torah, and how those curses are just warnings if we don't keep Torah. In other words, every curse in Torah is only a warning and every blessing a conditional promise. So no, only because it may appear in Torah does not mean it is destined to happen, especially when it explicitly states that these things will only occur when we stray away from Torah. 
And then sometimes people quote that pasuk in Devarim where it states that the Almighty didn't choose us because we were so numerous when we were the smallest of all peoples. But again, this is speaking about when he found us and not what would become of us and what influence we would have after accepting and keeping Torah. But anyways, I think we'll end here. Please join us next week for the following Haftarah. And for more information on everything Jewish, please visit TorahJudaism.org.